Christian is chosen by Jesus Christ. Mehdi Dibaj, Iran, 1994. Men choose a religion, but a Christian is chosen by Jesus Christ. To be a Christian means to belong to Christ. Jesus asked me to renounce even my life, to follow Him faithfully, not to fear the world even if my body must perish. I prefer to know that God, the Almighty, is with me, even if it means that the whole world is against me. I am in God's hands. For 45 years I have walked with the God of miracles and His goodness is for me a shadow that protects me in His love. The God of Daniel, who protected his friends, protected me during my nine years in prison and all the torments changed to my good so that I have the fullness of love and gratitude. Of all the prophets, Jesus alone was resurrected from the dead, and He remains our living mediator forever. I gave my life into His hands. For me, life is an opportunity to serve Him, and death is the privilege of getting to be with Him. Pastor Mehdi Dibaj of Iran was on trial for his life, and these words were the defense he gave in court. An upper-class Muslim, he and his family had converted to Christianity. He had dared to translate Christian radio programs and books into the Farsi language. He was arrested in 1985 and accused of apostasy, denying the Muslim faith. For this, he faced the death penalty. In Iran, social and political pressure is sometimes used to force Christians to recant their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Some are even tortured. Dibaj was imprisoned alone for two years in a cramped hole with no room to stretch his legs. While he was in prison, his wife, Aziza, left Dibaj and was forced to marry a Muslim. When Dibaj steadfastly refused to deny his faith, the court condemned him to death. But after one month, he was set free because of international attention that had been brought to this case. Soon after this, however, he was found dead in a park. It is believed by some that Islamic leaders had called for his execution. Despite losing their father, his four children remained faithful to Jesus Christ. As he faced the court that would sentence him to death, Pastor Dibaj said, I prefer to know that God, the Almighty, is with me, even if it means that the whole world is against me. He had learned the secret of being able to stand alone among men, standing with God. Pray for radio programs that preach the gospel to Muslims. Pray for safety for all those involved. Pray for the listeners that the word of God will penetrate their darkness and bring them a new life in Jesus Christ. That means it's going to be a good day. <laughs> All right, guys, we are in the final stretch of our 1090. That is good news. Man, it's been a challenge. It has been a challenge. And our theme this year for the 1090 is happy feet. The word says in Romans 10, uh, 14 and 15, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. We are the messengers who bring good news. Man, that is awesome. So the 1090, what in the world is this girl talking about? All right, 1090, it's the first tenth of the year, and it's a fast that we as a church do, and it's rooted in Romans um, 12, 1 and 2. It's us offering the first fruits of ourselves to God um, and in this time, we've been challenged in our time. We've been um, challenged with our time to give our time to the Lord. We have been going to Wednesday Night Word. That's our Wednesday night Bible study. That's at 630. Um, we've been part of a small group that meets once a week. And we have purpose to come to Sunday meetings and to serve him. 
we've changed habits, and we've committed to pray for our church and to pray for each other. And whoo, it's been awesome. First tenth of the year, 30, uh, 36 and a half days. And it's almost done. You guys, we're almost through it. Man. So if you've been here for any of that time, you've learned that um, the banner of God over this year is fortified, that we are fortified. You learned that we are carriers and we are soap. You've learned that God is not utopian, but he is love. Man, Pastor Dave did such an amazing job teaching that. And if you haven't heard that message, go to strongtower.church and listen to it. And, oh, man, it was really, really good. Look up some of these past messages. You guys, these have been some meat for those of us who are ready to move off of milk, right? We've been called to grow up. And it's good. It is good. So today, guys, we've been eating lots of meat. I just want to get back to some fundamentals, to touch up on some, some fundies, as we like to call it. Put on your fundies first. <laughs> yes, I did just say that. So we're going to talk about some fundamentals. In jiu-jitsu, we're always brushing up on our fundamentals. We're always um, going back to the basics because why do we do that? Well, because they work, <laughs> because the fundamentals work in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I love how learning self-defense in the physical mirrors learning self-defense in the spiritual. It, it's, it really does. It's amazing. So there are times when we're training, and one of the biggest things that gets in my way, like one of my biggest downfalls is, is I always try to put something on Dave, and he doesn't tap. He doesn't, like, say, okay, you got it. Like, he doesn't tap me right away. And so I let go of that one thing that I have, and I try something else. And then he comes out, and his, like, face is all red, and he's like, Dude, you had that. If you would have just waited a couple more seconds, I would have tapped. <sighs> Dang it. Ah, if I would have just believed. Huh. So today, we're just going to brush up. We got we to gotta keep, our, we gotta keep our, our game on point, right? So first off, we have to know Jesus is the foundation. Everything we build on, we build on him we build with him, we build through him, and we build by him because of his grace. He is the foundation. So how, how do we build? Well, we learn who he is. That's how we build. We learn who Jesus is. And we learn who we are in him. We are exhorted in Romans 12, 1 and 2 in Colossians 1.10, in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, and in many more places, to live a life that is pleasing to God. To live a life that's pleasing to God. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I definitely want to do that. So how? Don't you hate when someone tells you, hey, do this, and then they don't tell you how? <laughs> Give it to God. Thanks for that. How? <laughs> I want to live a life pleasing to God. How do I do that? And here, Christians, like, this is where we, like, we get all stumbly with it because we make up our own way. Well, that makes me really happy. So I'm going to do that because that makes me happy, right? That's living a life pleasing to God. God wants me to be happy. He does. What sounds like the biggest sacrifice for me? What is the biggest sacrifice for me? I'll do that, or I won't do that. That's what I'll do. That's how I'll live a life that's pleasing to God. What would make me look the holiest? I'll do that. And guys, that's, that's fine. Those are good goals, but there is only one way to please God. There is only one way to please God, and if you haven't got that, then the Bible tells us that all the stuff we do, all the works, all the stuff we do, they are as filthy rags. We're not going to go into detail about what filthy rags means, but basically it's yuck trash. Someone say yuck trash. It's yuck trash, man. So how do I live a life pleasing to God? What's my fundies? What do I got to put on? 
Turn to Hebrews 11. We put the fun in fundamentals or the mental. I don't know. <laughs> Hebrews 11. I'm going to read 1 through 3 and then 6. Here's how we please God. That's right. You got it highlighted. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Come on, guys. What are our fundies? Faith. That's right. Faith. We can know from the Bible that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Look, guys, faith is essential. It is fundamental in your building. Without it, whatever you build is not going to stand. Faith is crucial to living a life pleasing to God. God is so good that when we are born again, that's when we believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he really lived, that he really died, that he really rose again, and that he's really coming back for his church. And when we make him Lord of our lives and accept him as Savior, God completely equips us with what we need to live a life pleasing to him. Romans 12.3. It says, For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has, get, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. There are times when we get stuck, okay? We get caught in and life gets crazy, and it gets overwhelming, and things happen. And then we, eternal, we internalize that, and we say, like, oh, man, this needs to happen. I just need more faith. I just need more faith for this God. Give me more faith for this. But Romans 12, 3 tells us that there is a measure of faith, and God's already given it to you. We have it. We have the measure of faith. You don't need more faith. What you have is enough, but it's up to you to be a good steward of the measure of the faith that you were given. It's up to you to grow it. So when you were born, you were covered with skin, right? You're covered in skin. And as you grew, did your mom or dad have to go out and buy you new skin? New clothes, maybe, for every month you were alive, but... New skin, no, you were given a measure of skin, right? And as you grew, your skin grew with you. Are you picking up what I'm throwing down? All right, you were given the full measure. Now, as you grew from milk and you moved onto solid food, you needed bigger clothes, you got new clothes, but you didn't get new skin. Your skin grew with you as your body grew. Look, as you grow in the word, and as you grow in your love of Christ and your faith is tested and you overcome that measure of faith that you were given when you were born again will grow with you. You have all the faith you need. You guys, you are well equipped to living a life that is pleasing to God. Isn't that good news? Come on, that's good news. I got pretty feet right now. That is good news. Okay. <laughs> so now we're taking what we have and what we know, and then all of a sudden, because Christianity isn't rainbows and gummy bears, and if somebody told you that, they lied. I'm just going to throw down some truth right now. If you were told that, you were lied to. Sorry. We get thrown into situations that we weren't expecting. Anybody ever been thrown into a situation they weren't expecting? All right, cool. Me too. You're not alone. We get overwhelmed. Anybody ever been overwhelmed? Yes? Okay, me too. Been there. Man, it's crazy. Look, you guys, some, it, we ha life happens, man. Things happen. We feel like we've been blindfolded. We feel like we've been spun. And the bottom comes out from under us. And 
First of all, it's not just you. It doesn't mean that your faith is weak. If that happens, your faith is not weak. Okay? You've been given the full measure of faith. You have what it takes to get through it. Your faith is not weak. So if you find yourself in that situation, don't, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. Your faith is not weak. And it's nothing to be embarrassed about if you find yourself there. You guys, that's why we're here today. That's why we have each other. That's why God gave us each other. You guys, this is life. It's just life. The Bible tells us that we're going to have to fight for our faith. We have an enemy who's trying to rip us away from a God who loves us. We have an enemy who will do whatever he can to steal from us, to steal our friendships, to steal our stuff, to steal our finances, to steal our family. We have an enemy who is trying to kill our joy, to kill our success, to kill us. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us, who wants to destroy our legacy, who wants to destroy our faith, who wants to destroy our salvation. Okay, that's real. Check out Jude verse 3. I love how the message translation of the Bible puts it. It says this, Dear friends, I've dropped everything to write you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, begging that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us, for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and cherish. Read that again. Okay, dear friends, I've dropped everything to write you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write, insisting, begging that you fight with everything you have in you for this faith entrusted to us as a gift to guard and to cherish. Your faith is what you have to live a life pleasing to God, and the world wants to beat it out of you. The world wants to beat it out of you. See this? This is my jujitsu training stuff. This tells you a couple things about me. I have this. I live with this, and I live with this. It tells you that I'm built for combat, both physical and spiritual. I am built for combat. Your faith is what you have to live a life pleasing to God. The world wants to beat it out of you. And a lot of times when it's trying to beat it out of you, guys, it happens through our own words, through our own words. So I just want to give you some tools to shift your words and to shift your thinking and bring it back to set your sights on victory and not on defeat. Okay? Anybody want that? All right, cool. First off, we learned something in jujitsu. We learned position over submission. Position over submission. Someone say position over submission. All right. So what does that mean? That means if you can't control the position you're in, you're not going to get the submission you're going for. So control your position first and worry about the finish later. The same is true in the kingdom of God. Do not give away your birthright. All right? Do not give away your birthright. Position over submission. In Genesis 25, there are two brothers. One was firstborn. So as firstborn, Esau, he had an authority. He gets authority as firstborn. He was going to receive a double portion of inheritance and a blessing from his dad. So when his dad passed away, as his birthright of the firstborn, he would, um, he would become like the new head of the household. He would become the new, the new one in charge. Okay? This is his birthright. So if you have your Bibles, open to Genesis 25. We're going to go 29 through 34. One day when Jacob, that's the younger brother, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. And Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. 
So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as firstborn. Oh, Esau. <sighs> Man, that's bad. You guys, we tend to give away our authority with our own words. And I'm going to give you an example of how we do that, okay? So let's say something happens. We find ourselves in a situation that we weren't ready to deal with. We find ourselves in a situation that, that is just bad, right? And then we go, oh, my God, why? Why is this happening to me? Why? Now, don't raise your hand, but have you ever asked yourself this? Why? Why is this happening to me? We internalize. Now, let's not get all hyper-religious about this, you guys, all right? Okay, if you rob a bank, you're going to go to jail. That's a consequence of your actions. That's not the enemy fighting against you, all right? We're not going to get all hyper-religious. There are consequences to your actions. But when something comes out of the blue, all right, when something comes and attacks you and you go, ah, why is this happening to me? Let's just unmask this so you can get a proper position, all right? When you ask, why is this happening, your eyes are not on the solution. They're on the problem. Big problem, little God. You give up your authority because you're looking for an answer to appease your flesh instead of a solution to move you through. You see, Esau gave his birthright up for a temporary fix to something that made him uncomfortable, for a temporary fix to a problem that, with patience and work, would correct itself. So let me ask you a question. If you had the answer, if you had the why, would it be good enough? Would it be good enough? Would it really be what you're looking for? Would it really be what you need? Would having the answer move you forward from glory to glory? Because that's how the word tells us we travel, from glory to glory. So would having the answer move you from one glory to the next? Would the why, would the answer to the why, would that answer glorify God? Is knowing the why going to activate your faith? So let me give you a tool. Instead of asking why, ask God how. How are we going to get through this? God, how are we going to get through this? I'm in this situation. I was not expecting this. This is crazy. I don't know what's going on. God, how are we going to get through this? This positions you for victory. All right? This puts your eyes back on the prize instead of the problem. And this saying, how are we going to get through this, says we are going to get through this. Look, it declares in faith that you, in fact, are going to get through this, even though you don't know how. It also invites God into your situation. So that when you make it through your situation, he's glorified. He is glorified. Your test, in this way, your test has become your testimony. And what was meant to overtake you moved you further ahead and showed God true to his word. Man, isn't that good? We call that a reversal. Don't do this. <laughs> All right. Another thing we learn real quick. Now, real quick, probably one of the first things we learn is to do that. That's called a tap. You learn to tap. You learn it quick. Woo! <laughs> now, in our academy, we don't have a you are my enemy mentality. Or um, we don't even have a you're my opponent mentality. We're brothers and sisters in there, man. We're there to make each other better. That's the mentality we have. We're teammates. So during our practice or during our, our training on the mats, when someone gets you in a submission, when someone gets you, if you're not prideful, you learn real quick to tap out. 
Otherwise, you'll be broken or knocked out. <laughs> Very dangerous. Pride. This pride thing is dangerous. <laughs> the tap says, okay, okay, you got it. You got me. I give up. And then you high five your teammate, you fist bump them, and then you start again. It's where we're shaped. They're not trying to beat you up, per se, but they're crafting their game, and they're helping you craft yours. And it's the only way to grow is to know how to tap. Turn to James, chapter 1. I'm going to read 2 through 4. Con consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Man, Dave taught so well a couple weeks ago, God is not utopian. Look, in a utopian society, we never face adversity. But guys, I'm going to just take a commercial and bring it here. That's not how any of this works. All right? That's not how any of this works. And utopia is not love. Trials are going to come. All right? Trials are going to come. In life, you don't get a participation ribbon. You win and you lose and you learn how to deal with both. You might not be celebrated, okay? You might not be celebrated, but the goal isn't being celebrated for living on earth. I don't want to be celebrated on earth. I want to be celebrated in heaven. Come on. We get caught up here on earth in celebrating and celebrating mediocrity. Everyone needs to feel special. Everyone needs to be celebrated. Everyone, well, not everyone can do that. Well, not everyone can. <sighs> Come on, man. That's okay for little kids, but we aren't little kids. We're not. It's time to be the grown-ups in the room. It is possible to win, and it is possible to lose. <coughs> and you better know it. You better know it. The goal is not to be celebrated. The goal is just to move from glory to glory. Keep moving. Keep growing, okay? You've not arrived until you're in heaven. That's when you've arrived. The enemy, he would like to make you think that you've arrived, right? He'd like to make you think you have it all. He'd like to make you think you know it all because you know what? If you've arrived, guess what happens? You stop traveling. When you've arrived, why you got to go any further, right? Beware of that. Beware of people who've already arrived. You guys, pride will stunt your growth. Pride will be your fall. Don't get caught up in that. When you think you know it all, you close the door to Jesus. All right? Look at Matthew 13 and 58. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They knew it all. That's talking about Jesus in his hometown. Okay? Is this not the carpenter's son? Isn't this Mary's kid? This is Joe's boy. We know this guy. Pfft. It's just a carpenter. Pfft. So? And he could do... He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You guys, it is okay to be in learning, to be in a time where you don't know the answers. It's okay to be in learning, to allow yourself to grow. It's okay to go to God and say, Lord, I tap. Help me. That's why when we're in worship, we have our hands up. That means I surrender. It's the Christian I tap, all right? It's okay to say, I tap. God, help me. If you think other believers have nothing to teach you, if you think you are above them, if you think you are more mature than them, or you're starting to call them out, hey, you need to mature more. You need to do this. You need to, you are in pride. And you are stopping the hand of Jesus from doing any mighty works in your life. 
all right? It's okay to say, I don't know it all. I don't have it all. Lord, I tap. Help me. There's no shame in being a white belt, all right? We all start as white belts. Dave, Dave likes to say that a black belt is just a white belt that didn't quit, it never gave up. Look, this one's my belt. It's not black. I'm still on my journey, man. I'm still learning. I'm still learning. That's what that says. It just marks where I'm at on my journey. And these stripes, they just let you know I've still got a ways to go. I'm still on a journey, guys. Don't hate where you're at. You're on a journey. You're not done yet, all right? Don't get trapped in the snare of comparison. Goals are good. Goals are really good, right? Without vision, the people perish. Goals are good, but comparison is not. Comparison breeds jealousy. It creates division. And we do that, you know. People, we tend to do that. We tend to compare. Even, even in ministry, I see it. We've got to be careful of those who want to become the next big thing, the next big thing, who want to become like a, uh, the next Bethel or, or New Life or, or Lakewood. And those are great places, and God has a calling on those houses, but God has a calling on this house too, all right? Not to become them, but to become him, to become his hands, to become his feet, to become his eyes and his ears. And the Bible tells us, do not despise humble beginnings, okay? And if we're thinking generationally, we are a humble beginning, but we are a beginning, and that's good. It's easy to look at those we see and compare ourselves to them. Through years of teaching, through years of Dave teaching, I've heard people say, what I wouldn't give to be a black belt. Oh, that's so cool. Really? Really, because it takes time, it takes patience, it takes money, it takes training partners, it takes a whole lot of humbling, and it takes a love for the sport, right? Like, it's not my goal to be a big church like those other big churches, but it is my goal to help Strong, strong Tower to live out the calling that God placed on it. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. It's going to take money. It's going to take service. It's going to take partnership, humbling, and faith, and love for my God. Come on. You don't have to be a spiritual giant to bring your faith to God. In fact, you can be a spiritual white belt. He has given you the full measure of faith. And all he asks you to bring to him, you'll find in Luke chapter 17. And verse 6. So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Faith of a mustard seed. You don't need more. You got it all. And God's just calling you, Bring your mustard seed. Bring your mustard seed. Your life can change. And you can be closer to God. Now, you've heard all of this fundamental faith. You've heard all about it now, a little bit about fundamental faith. And it's not enough just to know it. Okay? Now you know, but this is a journey. And as we grow, faith is one of those fundamentals that we have to keep brushing up on, we have to keep checking in with, we have to keep fed, and we have to keep growing. James 1, 22 and 25 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So we've heard the word. We will be tested in our faith. So now we got to do it. Bring it to him to be activated, to go from white belt to blue to purple to brown to black, to grow. Amen? Pastor Dave, will you close us out? Yep. 
Amen. Hallelujah. That was awesome. Man, you guys blessed today? That was awesome. Hey, great job, children's, children's team. What are we going to call our children's team? Let's call them heroes, our children's heroes. Who are our heroes this morning? If you worked in children, stand up. We want to we recognize you. Who worked in children? Right here, back there. Amen. God bless you guys. I think Doreen's still back. I think Doreen and Ruth are back there. Um, God bless you guys. Thank you. How was it? Was it good? Awesome. It's the best 30 minutes of your day, I'm telling you, pouring into our young ones. That's our legacy, man. They're the only thing that we could possibly bring with us. The only thing. We, can't, we came in naked. We're leaving naked. The only thing we can bring are souls, you know? So let's pour into our children. Amen. And thank you so much. I know Stacy already said it, but man, I am so proud of you guys. 18 people stepped up to help out in children's ministry. 18. Say, hey, I'll carry that burden. That means if you're, if you're one of those people from, from today, February 4th, till June 3rd, I think you'll work three times. How easy is that? Many hands makes the work light. Many hands makes the work light. Come on, that's easy. Amen? That's easy. And what an awesome thing to do. Look, and I, I'm telling you guys, listen, children's workers, I'm not trying to turn this into a, a, a training, but man, we really, really underestimate free time. If you're down there and hanging out with young people, that's a great way to spend time. Like, I don't have anything to teach. That's okay. Just love on them. Create a place that's safe and loving. Be a safe place for them. Hallelujah. That's good. It's really good. So thank you so much. And thank you very much, you guys, for doing that today. Hallelujah. Bless you. All right. I have actually um, a update for you. I know I told you guys I'd be bringing you slides every once in a while. And I can only bring these slides when I have data. Um, so it takes a little while to create that data. Will you put that slide up, Chris? Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, that one. Excellent. Nice job. Okay, so let me explain this real quick um, so you guys can, can see what's going on. This is kind of like um, our, our status, like where, where we at. Okay, so I'm going to start over here on this side. So we put $10,000 into um, an account so we could secure a loan so that you guys could be where you are right now. So hallelujah. Bless God we were able to do that. So that's done, okay? But we can't taste or touch that money. Like it's, it's just there. All we can do is look at it and go, wow, remember that $10,000 we used to have? There it is. So uh, there it is. But then, then we have to, we pay our own escrow sometimes out of your loan. You know, you guys, whoever has mortgages in the house, you probably pay a little more than your mortgage and then they take out what's called escrow, right? We don't do that. We pay our escrow separately. It's cheaper that way. So we've put some money aside and we've already hit that goal. It's a little over $2,000. So boom, escrow is done. We don't have to worry about that for 2018. Bless God. Okay, missions, don't, don't get sad about this mission slide right here. Don't get sad about this. I know, it, I know it looks dismal right now. I know it does, but this is a long year. We got all year to do this, okay? So um, it's not a sprint, um, and, and we're going to get there. My goal this year is $8,000 into missions. It's going to happen, amen? It's going to happen, we're going to get there. All right, so um, now for the less exciting news. Um, January giving, we were about 40% off the mark. Um, we need uh, $2,500 to come in each week, and the average giving was at $1,500 a week. So that's where it's at, just telling you guys. Um, we were at a, a small deficit of $4,000, so um, that's got to come from somewhere. How many of you guys know that? Like when your bills are due, like that money's got to come from somewhere. Where's that money going to come from, Pastor Dave? I don't know. <laughs> God's going God's gonna to fix it. Hallelujah. Um, we, don't, we don't need more money. I know it looks like this is a money problem. We don't need more money. We need more Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the answer. I'm not interested in mammon. I'm interested in Jesus. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, Tanya, Tanya alluded to um, the hows and whys that, that, we got, that we came here. You know, like this was no secret when we got hired, right? And, and Kelly and Charity were actually part of, the, um, part of that team that, that brought us in. And we were really forward with them. We were like, hey, we're really into jujitsu. I have an academy. Like, we teach people how to fight. Are you guys the kind of Christians that are okay with that? And she's like, oh, yeah, we're, we got fighters in our congregation. And I'm like, perfect, introduce me. And she's like, I will. And I said, and I'm, like, covered with tattoos. Actually, I only have one. They're just not all connected yet. Um, I'm like, is that going to be a problem? She's like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? That's not a problem at all. And actually, the first time I came the first thing she said to me was like, hey, great job on your message, or that was really inspiring. She was like, I'm so glad you didn't wear a suit. <laughs> Do you remember that, Charity? I'm so glad you didn't wear a suit. We are so not that group. And I was like, man, amen. This is a match made in heaven. But um, we've been really open about who we are. 
And actually, um, Al Scott, who's my um, father in the, in the faith, he's my spiritual father. He's, he's the Paul, um, is Timothy. Um, and he used to tell me like every day, it was awesome. My spiritual father was also the dean at the Bible college. Um, so um, every day when I would see him, he'd look at me and he'd give me a big hug and he'd say, son, you were born for confrontation. He'd tell, I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, is that good news or bad news? But um, that's who we are. We're fighters. Amen. And that's why God brought us to Casper, because he knew this would be a fight. He, he knew that we would, he would take a pastor who would be willing to contend for this. You know, um, God bless the, the pastors who've come before us, um, but it's so easy to just tuck tail and run. You guys, I've got a really, really, not, not boasting, God has done it. I've got a really good resume. You know what I mean? But I'm not interested in sending it out. I'm interested in being right here where I am. I'm interested in this house. I'm interested in this church. I'm interested in this people. And this, this is a fight. And we're willing to fight for it. We're going we're gonna to knuckle up. We're going to gird up our loins, tighten up our belts, put on our fundies, check all that stuff, right? Like, well, look, and we get rocked sometimes. Man, and my guys will tell you, we don't always win every battle, but we will win the war. We always win the war. And we'll win this war because God is king. Amen. And the king always has one more move. The king's always got one more move. Hallelujah. So listen, I want, you to, I want you to give with your whole hearts this morning. You know, your tithe isn't, isn't your gift to God. Your tithe is giving back to God what belongs to him. It all belongs to him. How many of you guys know that? But God requires 10%. He said, bring 10% back in to show me your heart. Bring 10% back in to show me that you trust me more than you trust that money. You see, money's got a spirit attached to it. We'll talk about that more in the future. But God wants his spirit attached to your money. Everything in this life, hear me, church, everything in this life needs to be redeemed. And if you don't tithe, your money hasn't been redeemed. That's how God, when you redeem your money, the 90% goes further than the 100% ever could. That's what's awesome about redemption. It is a promise. Hallelujah. So let's give with open hearts. God bless you guys. Go ahead and pass those buckets. We've got a card swiper in the back. If you guys like to, you can do what I do. I just go to um, strongtower.church. And I click on that donate tab. That means I can, I, I just donate, like as soon as I get my paycheck, the first thing I do is go to strongtower.church and put my tithe in. I love it, so easy. Man, it's such a blessing. I remember when that stuff was first coming out. Tanya, do you remember this years ago? Before you could give with your card? And, and uh, man, the re religious folks in the church were kind of freaking out about it. What? Give with a card. That's awesome. God bless. It makes it so easy. God makes it so easy to give. Amen. If you gave this morning, let me pray a blessing over you. Father, I just thank you so much for all the givers in this house. Hallelujah. I thank you that they would join with us and partner with us. God, we made 60% of our goal last month. 60%. That's awesome. It's awesome. But we know that you're not a 60% God. You're not an 80% God. You're not a 99.9% .9 God. You are a 100% God. And so I thank you, God, that this month, that this is our day. Man, this is our day. And what a test, man. February is a short month. God, I trust you in Jesus' name to bring in the tithe to the storehouse that your account might be full. Thank you, Lord, that our hearts, that our hearts would be directed toward our king and not directed toward any other thing. We thank you, God. Man, okay, so for those of you who did not give but you want to, I want to pray for you right now. God says that he would provide seed to the sower. So, Lord, I thank you for those hearts that are desperate to give, those hearts that desire to give. Show them how to give, Lord. Show them that, that it's not being able to afford to give. God, it's, we can't afford not to. We can't afford to have our monies taken by the enemy. So, Lord, we thank you that you would save us, save us, save us from the enemy who would come and try to deplete our finances and deplete our resources. I thank you for that. And I pray, God, look, if you didn't give but you wanted to, listen, don't be in shame. There's no shame. There's no condemnation for those who are alive in Christ Jesus. It, it was taught to us a long time ago, and Rick, Rick testified. It'll taught to us a long time ago. Well, if you don't give, God's not going to bless you, and he's mad at you. You better give. Look, that's not true. God loves you. He loves you whether you give or don't give, right? But I've seen God bless people, I mean extravagantly, people who weren't givers. And you know what it caused them to do? Inspired them to give. So if you didn't give but you want to, God, I pray that you'd bless them. Lord, that you'd give them, that you would pour out such a blessing on their life that they wouldn't be able to ignore you and who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless God. Amen.